Now in the name of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good afternoon. <laughs> it is, it is a, a, a profound joy for me to be able to be with you on this Pentecost weekend, which is an appropriate time to have a Love is the Way diocesan festival. We just sang about that sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with your love. It is, it is a blessing to be with you, to celebrate and affirm with you the, the work that God is doing through you. And I have to tell you, I told the young people who are being confirmed, I don't know where, I guess they're scattered about, uh, but I told them that I've been ordained over 40 years and I'd never before, I haven't been a bishop 40 years, wait a minute, let me clear that up. Uh, <laughs> but, but I've never been a bishop some 20 something years and I never before have been at a service of holy confirmation and ordination to the sacred priesthood all at the same time. <laughs> it is a whole, this is a Holy Spirit or better yet to go back to the King James, this is a Holy Ghost party. <laughs> Holy Ghost Party. And I just thank you for all that you are doing um, in this diocese. I thank your, your planning committee, your, your staff, and, and above all, she won't say it for herself, but your bishop. You got one of the best. She's awesome. I used to run with her. Many years and many pounds ago on my behalf. <laughs> it is a blessing, Bishop Jennifer, and to the good people of this remarkable diocese. Thank you for letting me share a little bit with you. There, there is an old spiritual you know I suspect fairly well, it, sung by African slaves who, for all practical purposes, had very little hope in this world and very little expectation that the world, the way it was, would be changed. And I suspect sometimes we feel like that too. How many shootings? How many babies must die? How many people? Just children of God. Why must we be so divided? God loves Republicans, Democrats, and Independents. Jesus loves little children, and he loves the little politicians, too. <laughs> And there's a part of us that sometimes wants to, you know, we're coming out of a pandemic, sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> and yet it's still lingering around. And we know that the racial reckoning that happened when we saw George Floyd and Breonna Taylor killed before our eyes is still with us. Indian burial schools where young Indian babies, children were buried, being dug up not just in Canada anymore, but south of the Canadian border here. And we know the Asian Americans are sometimes afraid to go out on their streets. We know that LGBTQ folk sometimes afraid to be who they are. And sometimes you add it all together and then the poor folk of Ukraine, all they want to do is be free. And somehow, some way, they're going to be free. Somehow, some way. And you want to, like the psalmist, cry out, how long, O oh Lord, 
How long? Well, these old African slaves may have some medicine for us to help us along the way. In one of their songs, they said it this way. They said, sometimes I feel discouraged and think my life's in vain. But then the Holy Spirit, Pentecost weekend, <laughs> but then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. They sang, oh, there is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. Y'all know that one. There is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. And then they sang, so if you cannot preach like Peter, and I'm going to see if I can get the general convention and make this the official anthem of the Episcopal Church. <laughs> if you cannot preach like Peter and you cannot pray like Paul you just tell the love of Jesus how he died to save us all oh there is the bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole there is the bomb in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul oh we, we need some witnesses this afternoon we need some witnesses to that kind of Christianity. We, we need some witnesses to a way of being Christian that actually looks something like Jesus. Jesus said, I will send the Holy Spirit to you, the Spirit of truth who will teach you everything I've been trying to teach y'all. And he said, y'all, that was in the King James Version of the Bible. <laughs> Yeah, and then at the last, this is at the last supper. I love this passage. None of this is actually in the manuscript, but that's okay. Uh, but there's a passage at the last supper in John's gospel. Jesus says, there are many things that I could tell you, but you can't handle them right now. Oh, man, I wish I could find mine the master's mind. So tell me some of them. <laughs> tell me. He said, but when the spirit of truth comes, the spirit will lead you into all truth. Sweet Holy Spirit. Sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with your love. And for these blessings, we lift our hearts and praise without a doubt. We'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place. Oh, our job is to witness. A few days before the Pentecost happened, when the fullness of the Spirit was unveiled, disclosed. Like when Jesus came back, the Father came back. Like the whole Trinity said, we're going to show up now. And it was like earthquake, wind, and fire. There was a group called Earth, Wind, and Fire, but that wasn't the <laughs> Trinity. <laughs> anyway, the Acts of the Apostles describes what happened a few days before that happened, a few days, moments before Jesus returned to the fullness of the Godhead. And the text says it this way. So when they had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus replied, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit is come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You will be my witnesses in first century Galilee and 21st century America. You will be my witnesses. Our job is to witness whether you are to be ordained a priest, we need you to help us witness. Whether you are to be confirmed today, who's getting confirmed today? Raise your hand, let me see, where are you? Whether you be confirmed, whether you are being received, who's being received? Let me see your hands. And who is being reaffirming their faith? Let me see your hands. Uh, you, your job is to be a witness. And for anybody, stay with me, I'm coming to a point in a minute. For anybody who has been baptized, help me somebody. Let me see who's been baptized in this room. Oh, your job, our job is to be a witness. 
You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But here's what I, I like about this passage. This is a little bit before Pentecost happened. And the disciples, remember, they've been with Jesus. He's been raised from the dead. Look, that doesn't happen every day. <laughs> I mean, they have the TV show, The Walking Dead, but I don't want to see them. <laughs> right? And I don't think Jesus was a zombie either. So that, 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 No, he was raised to new life and glory and honor by the power of the love of God. They saw him. They talked to him. He had been dead, as we used to say in boxing. He was down for the count. And he was up and about within a few days. Oh, he was alive. He had seen that, and so they came to the only conclusion that actually makes sense. They said, Lord, this must be when the Lord is to restore the kingdom to Israel. This is now the time. This must be the end time. Uh, this must be the time when God is going to right all of the wrongs. This is going to be the time when God's going to make poverty history. This is going to be the time when justice will roll down like a mighty stream and righteousness like an ever flowing. This is going to be the time when we will lay down our swords and shields down by the riverside and study war no more. But look at what Jesus said to you. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. That's a, that's a way of saying, that ain't y'all's business. <laughs> Folk always trying to figure out when the end time is supposed to be. That's not our business. It's above our pay grade. He said, but this is your business. You will be my witnesses. That's our business. That's our job. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria in Indianapolis, in Indiana, in the United States, in the 21st century world, you will be my witnesses. And by witnessing to me and my way of love, you will help the world find life. Now, I know, and I know who I'm talking to, and ask an Episcopalian to witness, It's a hard sell. I mean, <laughs> but let, let me see if I can make the case. It, it says in Isaiah 43 that the people of God, the Jewish people of God, it says, you will be my witnesses. You will be a light to the nation. That's in the Bible. It says in Luke 24, thus it is written that the Messiah must suffer many things and then die, and repentance must, and forgiveness must be preached to all nations and you will be witnesses of these things. That's in the Bible. In John chapter 1, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came to bear witness to the light. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness. That's in the Bible. In, 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 in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you will be my witness. It's all over the Bible. I'm not making this up. Even for Episcopalians. Oh, witnesses. But I know Episcopalians well. And I know there's at least one lawyer in the house. <laughs> and, and, and Episcopalians are good, we, we're slick. Because if there's a loophole, <laughs> we will find it. <laughs> and the default loophole is the Book of Common Prayer. If it's not in the prayer book, we don't have to do it. We don't have to do it. <laughs> So I did a little quick research, Bishop Jennifer, and lo and behold, in the Book of Common Prayer, page 302, after, in both baptism and confirmation, after the candidates for baptism, how many people here were baptized? Let me see their hands. Yeah, okay. Um, the candidates for baptism have promised to renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God. You said you renounced them. And then he said, do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Savior? You said, do, do you promise uh, to, 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 to live by his grace and love? Do you promise to follow and obey him as your Lord? And you said you did, or if you were a baby, your godparents did it for you. Whether you liked it or not, they did it for you. And, and then, just in case you forget, we send a bishop around every couple of years, and we call that confirmation, 
to remind you of the promises you made at baptism to renounce all that is evil and hurtful that hurts the children of God and God's creation and to turn and follow Jesus Christ and his way of love and in confirmation in reception and reaffirmation you said we're still in and then to make sure you get it we then pray over you and one of the prayers is Lord send these people who have been baptized send them out into the world in witness to your love oh help me somebody oh oh Bishop Jennifer there's even more than that in the catechism, it says the ministry of laypersons. Now, let me be clear about layperson. Layperson really doesn't mean non-clergy. Layperson means people who are baptized. I don't know why they didn't say the baptized, but anyway, because uh, what it really means, everybody, whether you are ordained, you could be bishop, priest, deacon, layperson. We're all lay people because we're all baptized. So the ministry of baptized persons, check this out. This is on page 855. You can check me out is to represent Christ and his church and to bear witness to him wherever you may be. Help me, can I get a witness this morning? Oh, can I get a witness? And then if you still didn't get it, we remind you Sunday after Sunday in the Holy Eucharist, except during COVID when you probably couldn't get Holy Eucharist, but normally when you can get to it, on page 366, and now, Father, this is before you go on out, and now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful, Witnesses. faithful, Witnesses. faithful, Witnesses. you got it, faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. Oh, our job, like they used to say about Ford Motor Company, <laughs> our job number one is to witness, to witness to this Jesus his teaching, his manner of life, the power of his sweet, sweet spirit to witness to this Jesus and his way of love. I've, I've come to realize how important I, that is, both for us as Christians, followers of Jesus in the church, and frankly, for this world. A couple years ago, I was watching the, the Queen's 70th um, anniversary, which I, I, I'm just glad England can get a chance to rejoice. It, it, it's wonderful to see her. Um, I love the picture of her standing there as the jets of the British Air Force are going overhead, and the little kid is going like this. <laughs> but it's wonderful to see a country celebrate. When I looked at it, I remembered going to England for a little wedding a few years ago. <laughs> they haven't invited me back since, but anyway. <laughs> and, and in the sermon, I, you know, I preached about love. And, and that was a deliberate decision because love is at the heart of what Jesus is about. I mean, it, it's just clear. I mean, I mean, I could be wrong, but I think it's in Matthew 22 when a lawyer, another lawyer, uh, look, Lawyer comes up and says, what's the greatest law in the legal edifice of Moses? Jesus said, goes back to Moses. He quotes Deuteronomy and Leviticus. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then he adds on these two, love of God, love of neighbor. Why, yeah, you love yourself. Love of God, love your neighbor. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Do you know what an extraordinary statement that is? All the law and the prophets, everything Moses was trying to teach you, everything that you find in the Hebrew Scriptures, and by extension, everything you find in the New Testament, everything in the Bible is trying to show us and help us figure out how to love God and love our neighbor and love ourselves. And the truth is, it's all about love. And as Duke Ellington said, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. Oh. Oh, the truth is, if it's not about love, it's not about God. And if it's about love, God is somewhere in the neighborhood. Ubi caritas, where true love is found, God himself is there. Well, I was preaching on that, and I, I, had, I had to stay still. I didn't move beyond the pulpit. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't want them to take me out. I didn't, 
And so I quoted Baum and Gilead. And I had checked, I mean, the manuscript had been reviewed and approved ahead of time. And I checked with the Archbishop of Canterbury. I said, do people know the spiritual Baum and Gilead? He said, church folk know it. <laughs> and I said, well, how many folk go to church in this country? But I, I'll leave <laughs> I left that one alone. And so I was quoting him, and I was standing at the pulpit, and, and um, I, I, I could see a security guy off to my side. And, and he, and he was just kind of sitting there, you know, he listening. And I said, there is a bomb in Gilead. And home team woke up just like, <laughs> and I said, a healing bomb, a good bomb, medicine, ointment to make you well. I said, this dude's about to take me out of here in a second. But, but the greatest shock for me was when I was traveling around soon after that. And I can't tell you how many times people came up to me on the street, on planes, on tra I mean, literally. And in the course of the conversation would say things like, I didn't know that Christianity and Christians are about love. About six months ago, we commissioned a study for the Episcopal Church done in cooperation with the Ipsos Group, one of the largest marketing firms in this country. And it was a survey of the American population. And when they did, and it was a sample, it was a real sample, scientific sample, of the American population, when asked about Christians and their perception, 50% used the word hypocrisy to describe Christians. 49% used the word judgmental. 46% spoke of self-righteousness. 32% used the word arrogant, so we got off on that one. And nearly 50% use the word racist to connect with Christianity. Dear family of God, we need some witnesses. We need you priests to help us witness in the world in our way that's authentic. I'm not asking Episcopalians to be with y'all ain't. I, I ain't crazy. I know better than that. No, no, no. We, we need... Oh, I've got to stay COVID distance. I, I love y'all, but I got to keep it... <laughs> but we, we need you as priests to help the community of God through word, sacrament, through our life together, to then go out into this world and witness to a way of being Christian that looks like Jesus, that looks like love. Those who are about to reaffirm their commitment to Jesus and his way of love in confirmation, reception, reaffirmation, we need you to go out into this world and be witnesses to the way of love that Jesus has taught us. And everybody in this room who is baptized, that's all y'all. Only the dog is going to get out of that one. <laughs> And dog might do it too. We need you all to be witnesses to the way of love, to God's way of love, which is the way of life for us all. And I know, I know it's not easy. I know it's difficult to do sometimes. And I know sometimes you get tired. But just get up and go to church. Just get up and receive some sacrament. Get up and take that Bible and Get fed. Get up and go to a prayer. Do something. Do something. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. But anyway, you know what? I mean? Actually, that was what Joe Biden said the other day. Do something. <laughs> Do something that feeds your soul. And then go out and feed the world. We need you. This country needs you. This world needs you. Our church needs you. We need some witnesses. And when you get dispirited, just remember the wisdom of those old slaves. There is a God. And this God is real. And though we can't see him, we know this God is real. And just trust. I know that sounds easier said than done, but the 
it may be easier than you think. When I was bishop of North Carolina, I used to get up, you know, sometimes go to the office, but I lived in cars. I think Bishop Jennifer knows exactly what I'm talking about. You, you live in a car. I was wearing cars out but to the point that the finance people said, what are you doing to these cars? I said, well, I'm on the Indianapolis Speedway, Indianapolis 500. I'm just working, working. Actually, I did get stopped by a law enforcement officer. And I said, officer, I'm sorry. I was on my way to a funeral. And he said, that, that's OK, Reverend. We just don't want you to have to go to your own. I said, oh. I said, oh, you're very cute. Thank you for that. <laughs> but I used to put miles on cars. Now I get frequent flyer miles. I get on airplanes. And I live in Raleigh, North Carolina, which means if I'm going to go anywhere in the continental US, I'm probably flying from Raleigh to Atlanta. The old saying is, uh, you may be going to heaven, you may be going to hell, but if you're on Delta Airlines, you're going through Atlanta first. <laughs> <laughs> And so, you know, I'm always on Delta, I, I, enough that I actually know some of the flight attendants on some of their routes. Um, it's, really, it's really quite tragic. But anyway, that's the way it is. And so I get on the plane and I have a routine and, and I'm used to it now. I, you know, I always speak to the flight attendants. I got my mask on and nod to them. And say, I want them to know I'm a good passenger. Y'all, you're not going to have to have air marshals taking me down. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm good. Anyway, I sit down and get in my seat and, you know, put my seatbelt on and, um, you know, put my bags underneath and take out my iPad. I got the Bible on the pad. I go right to the Bible and just kind of read a few passages, just, just in case. Um, anyway, <laughs> and then I kind of sit there and I wait for the flight attendants. You know, they, once they get everybody on board, then they stand up and they, they do their thing. Um, I would ask all, uh, all passengers to please take your seats. Um, have your trays in their upright and locked position, um, uh, seat belts fashion. Um, and they say, in the unlikely event of an in a mid air emergency, oxygen masks will descend. I love that. Descend. It's like the Lord will descend from heaven. Uh, oxygen masks will descend from the ceiling. Place yours on first and assist your neighbor with theirs after yours is on. Um, also, uh, in the unlikely, I love that, unlikely event of an emergency, in this unlikely event of emergency, which we're mentioning for the second time, um, there are lights on the floor, and you'll find them um, at the exits. There's exits at the front, exit above the wings, and exits around the back. Um, and they go on through this, and then when they finish, uh, then the pilot comes on, and they all have that Air Force voice, hey, folks, we want to welcome you all aboard Delta Airlines. <laughs> Uh, we expect to have a good flight on our way to wherever it is we're going, uh, but maybe we may run into a little chop on the climb out. I love how they talk about a little chop on the climb out. There may be a little weather about two-thirds of the way in our flight, but we'll find a cruising altitude of 35,000 feet, and we're going to try to make it as comfortable for y'all as, as we can. Now, sit back, relax, and enjoy your flight on Delta Airlines. So you get on airlines and then the plane, you know how it is? It takes off, it goes down the runway, you know how it is? I mean, it goes down, the, and there are all those noises and stuff going on, and it's making all those noises, and the plane's making noises. They got the flaps in position so they can take off, so that, the, you know, so you can defy Sir Isaac Newton, and they keep going down, and it goes down the runway and picks up speed, and eventually, slowly but surely, that plane begins to take off, and you can actually feel it defying gravity, and it's just an incredible thing, and it takes off, and I hate it when they bank before they get all the way up. But anyway, sometimes they just bank to make that turn. You say, do y'all know what you're doing? And you anyway, you finally get up to 35,000 feet. They take off the seatbelt sign, and you can find, at my age, you finally can go to the bathroom. I mean, that's it. <laughs> and all of that has happened, and I got here via Delta Airlines through Atlanta, and I never saw the pilot. I got on a plane. I didn't know who was flying that plane. I didn't know did that pilot get a C in pilot school or an A, <laughs> right? I didn't know was that pilot an honor student or did he or she get out by the skin of their teeth? I didn't know anything about the pilot. I didn't know what they were doing the night before. You know, were they drinking and weren't supposed to be drinking? I mean, what was going on? I, I didn't ask any of those questions. I just trusted Delta Airlines. And then on top of that, I didn't know who the mechanics were, who inspected the plane. Did they actually inspect the plane? Did they really do it or did they just put it on paper that they had done it? 
I didn't know answers to any of those questions because I trust Delta Airlines. And I finally realized if I can trust Delta Airlines, who I have not seen, I can trust Lord God Almighty, who I have. Oh, oh, we can do this thing. Oh, if you cannot preach Peter. Whoa. <laughs> I guess that was the heavenly chorus said. <laughs> if you cannot preach like Peter and you cannot pray like Paul, you just tell the love of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. How he died to save us all. Yeah. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded Oh, there is a bond in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. God love you.